I think I think we're live, everyone. Oh my Hello. gosh. Hello oh. everyone. And welcome to the first episode of our series. Um, we're still trying to decide on a title, but right now we're gonna call it the Glacier Ridge campaign. Um, because that's where it's going to be taking place. Um, I don't know if you noticed the music in the background, but we've completely changed our sound. Well, so, uh, that's cool. Um, anyway. Welcome to our campaign. Uh, we are basically just going to be doing, like, a, uh intro episode tonight um we're basically going to be doing some job interview type things here uh i don't know how much you are aware of this campaign so far i don't know if we really talked about it in chats or anything so i'll I mean, give you just a quick world building we did the one world building but we've kind of cut and trimmed some of that well i've kind of cut and trimmed some of that i've kept a lot of it in it's just changed a little bit itself um so this is the glacier ridge campaign for now um and what it is is a campaign in modern times shocker it is based in northern canada in a fictional town but a true location in that area uh so it's based in a place called glacier ridge which like i said is a fictional town and uh in that area is the nahani valley now i don't know what you guys know about the nahani valley but there's been a lot of weird stuff that has gone on there um, and that's kind of why we chose that location. Um, on top of that, this is not D&D, even though we posted it as D&D on, um, Twitch. I couldn't find a, another way to put it. Um, for some reason, that's what it chose. Uh, Monster of the Week is not an option on Twitch, so I apologize if you're here. But it is still a tabletop RPG. Uh, it's just using a slightly different system. Um, that being said, um, I don't know if you know what Monster of the Week is, but it's using the, I believe it's called Powered by Apocalypse system, which is just rolling 2d6. Uh, six and lower is an automatic fail. Seven to nine is a mixed success, and ten and above is a complete success. Um, it kind of airs on the side of more role-playing and less uh what's the word i'm like less rule oriented stuff it's more kind of just yeah do whatever you want to do and then roll i know DD is very much like that too but it does have some boxes that you kind of have to fit into especially when it comes to like combat and stuff like that. um that being said this is a internet show. We are running an internet show that basically had a incident that happened about two years ago. Uh, it's called The Search. And two years ago, a incident happened that some of our crew was murdered on a investigation into the Goat Man. Um, while they were trying to debunk it and look for different things, it turned out that it was actually just a crazy person, and said crazy person ended up killing some of our crew. Um, so it's been two years, and in that two years, the team has spent some time researching, trying to build a crew again, trying to build up some information, and go to a location where they think they will actually find some paranormal stuff. Um, the paranormal stuff that we're kind of investigating into is less like ghosts and things like that and more like monsters and uh, aliens and uh, cryptids falling into that category. Um, anyway. Um, what else am I missing here? So, like I said, the first part of this 
uh, series is going to be our job interviews. So, like I said, they're trying to hire a whole new crew, and that is our players. They are being hired into this internet show and being asked questions to relate to their jobs and see how they answer them, and that will kind of give you an idea as to your uh, the characters and their backgrounds and kind of their personalities and stuff. Uh, basic job interview questions, so uh, if you want to learn from their answers, you can kind of use it in your own job interviews if you really want to. Not definitely, a good idea. Definitely, for sure. Um, uh, so, quick question. Sure. After the interview, do we roll to see if we were successful? <laughs> no, obviously you're being hired for the job. As I'm not going to make you make a whole new character and whole new backstory if you fail at the job interview. Um, but, so... Well, I'm going to bomb this interview on purpose. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so... There was no other applicants. <laughs> the first job interview is going to be for a security special. Because obviously, uh, because of the incident that they had uh, last time they were doing this show... By the way, the show was quite successful. But after something like that happens... It's things tend to take a take a damper um anyway so the first one is going to be our security specialist who is named is named harley charlie andrews there you go um <laughs> so uh so charlie um just looking over your resume here um First thing, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. I'm not really anything special. Got out of high school and I joined the military. I was there for a few years and some events out of my control happened and I got discharged. Fair enough, fair enough. And then um, what, what attracted you to this job? Well, I haven't really been around Canada. I've been overseas with the military, but in Canada, I've always been stuck in the city. This position gives me a chance to able to see more of the country. Oh, don't worry. You'll see a lot of the country. We spend a lot of time traveling. Um, our first job, of course, is going to be going up to the Northwest Territories. So you're going to see a lot of beautiful areas, and uh, we're, we're definitely going to need somebody who can, like, fight off some wildlife. So good thing we're uh, looking for here. Um, what is your greatest strength, would you say? Uh, I'm very observant. There's generally not much that gets past me, which for my previous position was quite ideal, and I believe it would be important here as well. It will be very important here, especially if we do come across like Bigfoot or something. Um, obviously, we're we're still on the search, you know. Um, what would you say is your greatest weakness? Uh, I struggle with speaking in front of larger groups of people, but I tend to avoid it as much as possible. Try just trying to keep to a few people at a time. Uh, I've been working on this. I recently enrolled in a online course for public speaking, which is helping grow my confidence and give me the ability to speak in front of larger groups. Very good, very good. Um, so, that being said, uh, how would some of your previous colleagues describe you then? Uh, I believe they would say that I'm dedicated to what I do and I'm a very hard worker. I get what needs to be done, done. Um, okay. And then so that's kind of just most of our general questions. Uh, just need to ask you a few questions specifically related to the job, of course. We want to make sure that you're able to accomplish this job with no problems. So, um, what strategies would you implement to ensure the safety of the team during field investigations, uh, considering the past incident with the Goatman search? 
Uh, primarily, it would consist of very thorough risk assessment to make sure we have a good idea of what we're getting ourselves into. Uh, it would involve also involve stuff like pre-mission briefings, uh, making sure everyone is trained with the protocols and the equipment we're using and uh, making sure that we have constant communication and plans in case of an emergency. Good, good. That's all good good stuff for sure. Um, how do you handle unexpected security threats? What measures would you put in place to mitigate risk during our expeditions? Uh, because expeditions create an environment that is very dynamic and unpredictable, uh, things need to be handled a bit differently. Uh, I personally would do it through risk management, contingency planning, uh, making sure there's always the uh, very good communication protocols, uh, using any technology and equipment we have to the utmost of their capabilities, and as well as being in contact with local authorities in case we need any assistance from them. Okay, thank you. Um, have you dealt with any similar high-risk scenarios in your previous roles? And if so, how did you manage them? Uh, in my previous roles, particularly during the military, there were various high-risk scenarios that demanded strategic and disciplined approaches to ensure the safety and security of the, all the personnel and assets. A uh, notable instance is the team I was in got cornered. Uh, uh, we, I was able to get everyone into a safe area and reach out to the base where they sent out reinforcements and got us out of there. All right. Yeah, especially when you're in like military scenarios, I, I kind of figured you'd have an answer to that, but I'm not sure. Um, how do you conduct a thorough risk assessment before an expedition? You mentioned that you were going to use risk assessment as a key component. Uh, so how do you conduct that? And then we want to take into account known dangers and then potential unforeseen challenges as well. So how exactly do you go about doing? Uh, primarily, it would be having defined objectives and essentially a scope for what we're trying to accomplish for that particular mission uh we would need to research and gather as much intelligence on it as well as the surroundings uh, as we can to both ensure we know what we're dealing with and know essentially where we can go in case shit hits the fan fair enough um in the event of an emergency during an investigation what specific steps would you take to ensure the safety of the team and how do you prioritize your actions along? Wait, what? I don't see this question. I wasn't prepared. Well, you got to answer it. Uh, can you repeat it, please? <laughs> In the event of an emergency during an investigation, uh, what specific steps would you take to ensure the safety of the team and how do you prioritize your steps along the way? Uh, primarily the first resort is always the safety of the team members themselves. So we would need to get everyone a safe distance of from whatever any potential danger is. And after that is taken care of, deal with any... Why are you guys making faces? Uh, she tried <laughs> video calling me. Just keep <laughs> going. Exactly. I tapped a button. Uh... Once every once we know everybody is out of danger, we would be taking care of any medical assistance required to any of the members. And after the people are dealt with, we can work on securing any critical machinery or data we have collected and reaching out to the proper authorities to get us aid. Um so how do you prepare the team then? So you mentioned we want to train the team a little bit. Uh, how do you prepare the team for potential security threats or unexpected situations? And then uh, what kind of tra <coughs> sorry, what kind of training protocols do you do you actually implement? Do you have like videos? Do you have books to read? What what kind of training protocols? 
Uh, the training makes uh, is essentially just to make sure everybody is aware of the potential risks out in the field. It's also making sure that everyone is capable of using any of the communication technology we are using at any given time. And uh, basic first aid training and security awareness training as well. Generally, the context of the training, it differs from piece to piece. It can involve uh, bringing someone in to help guarantee we're doing it correctly, or it can be as simple as reading instruction manuals on the devices. Fair enough. Um, so what kind of communication systems and protocols do you, uh, you use? What, what would you establish to maintain contact and coordination with the team? We're gonna be going into a lot of remote or isolated areas, especially our first mission here heading up to the Northwest Territories. We might be in areas that don't have cell phone service or might not have internet access in some areas. So what what protocols and what systems would you put in place there? Uh, the primary systems of communication would include satellite communication devices and two-way radios for direct communication between the team and to emergency services. Uh, it would also include emergency beacons, GPS tracking, and scheduled check-ins with people not out in the field, so everyone is aware that if we don't reach out, something is probably going wrong. So, just a quick question here. When you say emergency beacons, are we talking like players, or do you have some other source of uh, beacon technology? Uh Flares are good in a lot of situations, but they can also start fires in a forest. They're not ideal. That, that is the main part I was asking about, because in the areas we're going into, some they have fire seasons, and we got to be very careful that we don't burn down an entire yeah. national park, you know? There is some technology out there that it's... Uh, Te a technological beacon it will essentially send out a distress signal that can be picked up by radios or satellite and is automatically forward on to emergency services all right so tech satellite got it um how do you strike a balance between providing security measures and allowing them to allowing the team the freedom that they need for their work um, can you provide an example as well that this came in some of your previous roles? Uh, a team such as this, uh, providing the freedom would be essentially not forcing them to stay in a confined area. Uh, but you also can't let them just completely venture out of sight. You need to be able to keep an eye on them. and above this there needs to be constant communication between everyone in case someone does slip away or something happens further away that can't be seen is so everyone is immediately aware so as you... for Sorry. an example yeah. from the past uh in the military things are generally more confined uh i wasn't really ever a part on anything where people needed more freedom fair enough um are you thinking more like long range walkie talkies or do you have something else in mind uh long range radios would be the best for communication out in the north uh, as there's no cellular internet to go off of, they, everyone also should have satellite communication, so essentially satellite phones, in case the radios do fail. Satellite. Okay. Um, in a previous role... Can you provide me an example that you were in a high risk situation that you successfully navigated? Then kind of pinpoint some specific strategies and precautions that you might have employed at that time. Well, while I was with the military, I was involved in a mission to rescue hostages from a facility deep within hostile territory. Uh, 
we did successfully get them out without any real casualties. Uh, we approached it using by gathering as much intelligence as we can using drones and recon to find uh, uh, Sorry, you're cutting out a little bit there on this Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you miss something? I don't know, you just cut out, just go back like five seconds. Okay. Uh, we, uh, started by gathering intelligence using drones and recon to find the movement of the personnel at the facility, and we went in using a stealth approach so they wouldn't see us coming. Uh, we also had multiple contingency plans in place in case of unforeseen events happening, new people showing up, really planning for anything we could think of. Uh, after we completed it, we had any we had multiple med members of our medical team on standby, ready in case anyone needed their help. Fair enough. Um... What sort of logistical planning uh, of the security managers would you put in place for our expeditions? What considerations would you take into account? And then how would you adapt when different things happen or we go into different environments? Uh, for any situation, there's the same basic steps to prepare for it. Uh, you start with risk assessment to find what the major concerns are in that environment and you then train the team to be more prepared for that environment at least all you can uh, you also always make sure that your com communication protocols and the emergency response plans are always up to date with the current situation we're in so just a real life example here um, so in the Nahani Valley, there's rumors of these pockets that you go into a forest and there's areas that are cold and bitter because it's northern Canada, but then there's pockets in this same forest that are actually like temperate rainforest. Uh, how would you deal with going from like bitter cold to a place where you might get attacked by like large bugs or different types of animals that are in this area? Essentially, you just need the equipment that is designed to handle those situations. So, for example, the cold, you need the clothing and the jackets needed to keep you warm. But they also need to be light enough that if it does suddenly be somehow become nice, it is easy enough to pack away into a bag. Uh, as for handling bugs, generally from my experience the best way to handle them is not is having minimal exposed skin uh it'd be easy enough to follow that if it's cold when we start out perfect um now we're going into a small town um and we need to be on our we need to have good relationships with the town so how would you, as our security specialist, establish and maintain a positive relationship with the local authorities and law enforcement that are in town? So I know there's a sheriff station in town and it'll be a very minimal uh, law enforcement presence, but they do have say over what happens. So how would you go about maintaining that relationship? Uh, I'd begin by researching uh into the context of how the town works and the uh i can't think of the word i just had it in my mind <laughs> that's okay uh, we all stumble sometimes yeah it's essentially learning of the situations going there their standards and what they do and making sure that we don't go out of line of what their opinion on people uh, and as for building or uh, keeping a positive relationship with the authorities there, I believe that is best done simply by building trust with open communication. We have nothing to hide, so they there's no reason they can't be uh, part of it and just knowing what's going on. 
All right. Uh, and then final question, this might be an easy one for you. What are some of the latest tools and systems that you're using um, so that we can enhance the safety of our investigative team? Uh, the major tools are the satellite communication technology and the radios for constant communication. Uh, it also includes items like surveillance drones to monitor a much larger area and GPS tracking devices that can be on both people and equipment so we always know where everything and everyone is. Fair enough. All right. Uh, well, we will go over some things here. Um, that is pretty much all the questions that we have for you. But um, are there any questions that you have for us? Uh, what specifically happened to the last team? I tried looking into it, but there's very little information out there. Um, well, we faced an unfortunate incident during one of our previous investigations uh, that led to a hiatus in the show. Um, it was a challenging and unexpected situation, but we took the necessary time off to prioritize the well-being of our team and reassess our operational protocols. Um, because of this incident, we've since implemented enhanced safety measures such as yourself um, and are committed to moving forward with a renewed focus on ensuring the security and success of our future endeavors. Um, we appreciate your understanding of this and look forward to discussing how your unique skills and expertise can contribute to the continued success of the search. Th I hope that answered your question. A bit vague, but it did mostly. Perfect. All right, we'll get back to you soon. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, interview one out the gate. That is Charlie Andrews. Charlie Andrews, I think. <clears throat> All right, who's up next? I guess we'll go with I guess we'll go with Wyatt because he's getting a shorter interview. All right, so um, Wyatt. I mean, we already know all we need to know about you for the most part, but we got to have at least some process, you know? Um, so let's just ask a few questions. Uh, well, I, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, whatever. Wyatt, just tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, Tom, let's just do this like it's any other day, because, you know, that makes total sense. You want to know something about me? Is that what you're saying? You don't want to just skip into what's my greatest weakness, what makes me strong, you know, all that stuff. I mean, so, it, it's on the list. So, yes, let me just grab the pen. A little bit about myself. My name's Wyatt. I'm uh, almost 13. Um, I thought we were going way older. Oh, no, it's 14. I'm sorry. It's been, it's, you know, it's hard to keep track of things with all the alcohol. Um, oh, you're not drinking, you are you? Of course not. Um, so, uh, my name is Wyatt Harris. Um, I live with y'all and essentially y'all adopted me. So, you know, we're finishing up working on some more, uh, episodes of the search we're gonna try to bring this back uh you know since everything in the past and all that um i still am afraid of the dark sometimes um but i i think i'm doing pretty good i think that this uh, new show is going to be great looking forward to it all right. So, what attracted you to the cameraman position? What what made you want to get involved in the show? Uh, I think really it was when y'all told me that uh, I had to, you know, pick up a camera and be part of the sh crew to help out around here and pull my own weight. Um, you know that that really stuck it. That's that's what attracted me to it. I think that was really kind of what attracted me to the position and really sold it all right if you want to be that way um 
what's your greatest strength then? Well, I think being able to continue uh, moving on and persevering after walking in on my entire family being brutally murdered uh, is a pretty good one. Uh, you know, the fact that I can just put one foot in front of the other every day, I think is pretty, a pretty good strong, uh, strong strength of character. Uh, what would you say your greatest weakness is then? Uh, my greatest weakness is probably the fact that there are days when um, getting out of bed is rough. I can still sometimes see my mom's face uh, like I found her. Um, I'm always afraid that the next town we're going to come to is going to be my ticket. Uh, maybe next time I'm not at the movies. Maybe I'm home eating popcorn. Listen, uh, we have, we are hiring security. Don't have to worry. Everything's going to be just fine. They're going to have guns on them. And that same thing isn't going to happen again. We'll see. Hopefully not. It won't. Calm down. Anyway, that that's all we're going to ask you. It's fine. Don't worry about it. All right. Next job is our researcher slash analyst role. And this job belongs to Frankie... Whitlock. Yeah, Whitlock. Frankie Whitlock. Alright, well, it's nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Tom. Um, we're just going to ask you some general questions first, just to kind of get a feel for you as a person. Um, so the first one, of course, uh, tell us something about yourself. Um, I'm Frankie. Uh kind of a foster kid. Um, I like books. I like knowing stuff. I like digging into information. Well, hey, that's uh, that's good for the role, of course. So what uh, is that kind of what attracted you to this job then? Or what, what did attract you to the job? Um, I mean... Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I mean, considering the stuff that you guys look into, the bunk, I mean, I've got a lot of useless knowledge on it. I figure if I have it, you know, it might help to get paid for it, too. Uh, I mean, it's definitely nice to get paid for, you know, some passion that you have. Uh, what would you say your greatest strength is? Um, probably the fact that I keep digging even when I hit a dead end. Fair enough. Um, what would you say your greatest weakness is? Not knowing when to quit. I mean, isn't that kind of the first one, too? Eh, it's a... It's a strength. It's a weakness. You know, it depends on who you talk to. I'm always right. gonna keep digging. But even if I know it, there's... You know, I hit a dead end. You know, it's cold. It's... Trail's done. I'm gonna still keep trying to dig and... I figure if it's not me setting my own deadlines, maybe I won't dig as hard. Or as long, I guess is the word. Alright. Um, and then 
how would your previous colleagues describe you? Mm. That depends on who you talk to. If it's online, they think I'm great and I've got a lot of great theories. If it's in person, they just kind of give strange looks and think I'm weird. Um, so it really just depends on your audience. Uh, uh, all right. So that's it for our general questions, but we're going to start diving into a little bit more job related questions. So, describe your approach to gathering and analyzing information about cryptids and other related legends. How do you make sure that the information that you're finding is actually accurate? Well, usually when people are writing about cryptids, there's a lot of inconsistencies. Once things start lining up, you it tends to push you in the right direction. Granted, pretty much everything I found I've been able to prove is fake, a bunch of poppycock, whatever you want to call it. Um, but consistencies are still there. It's just I usually find the person that's just trying to get on TV or, I don't know, pay attention to them. Um, and I mean... When you look at it, a lot of them are just kind of all the same. They just take bits and pieces from one to the other, and something's changed, but there's always, like, a consistent theme. You know, we have kind of come across that with our own reason as well. Have you worked with a team in the past? Um, how do you collaborate with others? Like, how well do you work as a team? that can piece together the information that you found and develop theories about um well not a professional team but i have like i've had a group in the past where we would dig into the same topic and share what we found if they found something different if we found the same thing bounce theories off each other stuff like that um Growing up mostly online, but, um, I had to do it, you know, in college classes and stuff, because that kind of forced me to talk to people in person, but, I mean, it's the same concept, just talking instead of typing. Okay. Um, can you provide an example of a case where your research skills were crucial in unraveling the mystery behind... For example, let's say a cryptid sighting, but it could be anything uh, that used your research skills. Um, well, I don't know if it helps. When I was in my third, maybe fourth foster home, I don't know. Um, one of the ladies in the neighborhood swore up and down that there was a chupacabra coming out at night and it was trying to get her dog or whatever. It was just a big cat that had, like, mange or something. But... <laughs> oh, man, I was so glad I stalked that thing for, like, a week. Awful. You stalked it for a whole week? Well, yeah, I couldn't catch it. it took a minute. Well, when you say you don't really know when to give up, I, uh, I think we found... Found the time. <laughs> Um, I gave up because I solved it. You know, it's not a chupacabra, it's just a cat with mange. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Oh. Um, she never talked about it after that, so. So, cryptid legends often span across different cultures. Uh, how do you approach cross cultural research? So you can gain a comprehensive understanding of the cryptids and their associated folklore in these different diverse regions. For example, Bigfoot is known through many different cultures. Um, let's say, for example, the Wendigo, known in many different cultures. Skinwalkers, same thing. Um, so how do you kind of 
it can choose which ones all fit together. Um, well... Most cryptids have, like... It's not a category, necessarily, but it's like... You know, you're not gonna put a werewolf and a vampire in the same group. Like, one's more of, like, a creature, and one's something undead. Like, vampires and zombies, yeah, sure, put them in the same category. But, I mean... Usually, like, if you're talking about, like, a Wendigo or a Skinwalker or something like that, you're gonna look at anything that could be related, you're gonna kind of find the similarities and see where they line up. That's the easiest way to... It's like the Kelpie and the Loch Ness Monster. Basically the same thing. Fair. Um, so what methods do you specifically use to make sure that the accuracy and reliability of the data um, are verified and that the information that you've gathered during the recent research is also accurate, um, especially dealing with the potentially elusive or mythical creatures? Um... Mostly books online is usually just a bunch of crackpots, but published materials are usually a little bit more reliable. Instead of just open forums. And I don't rely on pictures. They're all half the time they're too blurry. They could just be a bush that's shaped like a wolf or something. Yeah, we have run into a few of those on our journeys, of course. Uh Especially in the dark, using night vision cameras, some things can look like other things, and it's, it's hard to, well, hard to narrow it down too, you can Yeah. budget, so I don't... Unless it's like a historic photo, like the Loch Ness Monster sighting, I really don't trust. Just... So, uh, how do you collaborate with uh, subject matter experts? Uh, such as zoologists, anthropologists, or folklore experts to ensure that a well-rounded and informed approach is placed into our cryptid investigations. We're not just your run-of-the-mill, like, oh, I saw Bigfoot out there. Um, we want to make sure that we can, like, verify with these different professionals, make sure that we're not just, as you mentioned, the crackpots that you find on the internet. Um, well, usually, the couple of times that I've actually talked to them, not that it's often, um, I'll, when I'm bouncing ideas off of them, I've always tried to, like, slip a wrong fact in there and see if they catch it. Usually, you know, most of them do, which is nice, because then it's like, oh, okay, you actually know what you're talking about, but, so... I kind of test their knowledge and they test mine. It's kind of fun. Yeah, no, it's good to bounce bounce off each other just to make sure. Um, in your experience, how do you approach debunking myths or separating fact from fiction when research, researching cryptid sightings? And uh, if you have done that, um, can you provide an example where it led to debunking a cryptid claim? Um, I mean, most of the cryptid stuff I've debunked myself is just random things that people say in the neighborhood, which it's easy to be like, no, that's not true, this is the wrong region, or whatever. Um, I mean, some of them are harder to debunk than others, but the further I've dug into some of them, they all... Like, I'll end up finding, like, little pieces of information that end up being... Like, oh, that's... You know, you find a story that aligns with this, and it's like, oh, that wasn't real. Okay. But... You keep digging, you find another false claim, you know, it's just... When they stack up in one direction, it's kind of... Makes sense. Yeah. No, it, it does make sense, um... 
And I 100% agree. If we're if we're trying to be legit about this, we need to make sure that we're not just another fake news story that's coming out online. Um, so, how do you incorporate technology such as like data analytics or uh, GIS systems or GIS um, into your research process to uh, enhance your efficiency and the accuracy of your findings? Um. Right now I have a couple of running Excel sheets with statistics and things that I found on certain things, what I've already covered, what I've so have questions on, things like that. Um, control F is a beautiful thing, because I can just search through there. Um, I'll bounce back and forth sometimes with people that I have some rapport with online. Um, I try not to do like the random forums because those people usually don't know what they're talking about but every now and then you find a couple of them yeah you, you gotta make sure who you're talking to verify your sources for so you mentioned at the start of this interview that you kind of don't know when to stop but these investigations often require long term research efforts um how do you develop or implement your strategies to make sure that you maintain and ensure jumbled two words together there um, that you don't lose momentum or focus on that specific task? Um, I don't really like things being unanswered. Just kind of being like, oh well, is not worked out. Uh, I mean, until, you know, I'm gonna go until I find what I'm looking for, and if I don't think I found what I'm looking for, I'm gonna keep going. That's, that's how it's always been. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. We don't, we don't like quitting either. That's why we're starting this back up again. Um, how do you navigate public records and archives to gather information related to cryptid sightings? Can you share a situation where this might have been pivotal, pivotal in understanding a cryptid legend? Um, the best way to navigate public archives Don't piss off the librarian. They know every corner of that place. You could list, like, a random news article from the New York Times in 57, and they could tell you where it's at. You piss off the librarian, you're not finding anything. True, they uh, they hold the keys to a lot of no. It definitely makes navigating a lot easier instead of being pointed to a general jumble of information. So, I do my best to not piss off everyone I come across, especially if I need something from them, so. Well, that actually kind of leads into our next question as well. I feel like it might be a very similar answer. So, these investigations can sometimes involve sensitive cultural or ecological aspects. Um, how do you make sure that your research approach is ethically sound and respectful of the community's environments involved? I mean, obviously don't purposely piss anybody off. Uh, you gotta kinda know... You gotta know when to step back and not think that somebody else is delusional, and you, um, you gotta take people as they are. Right? It's fair. Okay, so, 
that pretty much does it for all of our questions. Uh, of course, we have the final question here. Do you have any questions for us? Yeah, why'd the show stop in the first place? Well, um, we faced an unfortunate incident during one of our previous investigations that led to a hiatus in the show. Um, it, so was a died. it was a challenging and unexpected situation, and we took the necessary time off to prioritize the well-being of our team and reassess our operational protocol. Uh, we've since implemented enhanced safety measures and are committed to moving forward with a renewed focus on ensuring the security and success of our future endeavors. We appreciate your understanding and look forward to discussing how your unique skills and expertise can uh, contribute to the continued success of the, sh the search. Yeah, I figured somebody died. Like how someone asks what happened in robot mode engaged. <laughs> Almost like it's a trained response. <laughs> um... Um, Any other questions at all? When would I start? Uh, well, we're probably going to be take, uh, taking some time here just to make sure that everything all lines up. Um, but we're probably going to be starting the show up in the next week or so. Where are we going first? Uh, we're actually planning on heading up to the Northwest Territories. Uh, where are you from? Ohio. Oh, you're not from Canada. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, do you have means of traveling to Canada then? Do you have your passport and everything? Yeah. Okay. okay. Work visa. Canada needs them too. <laughs> yep. I believe we are recording again. All right. So, uh, welcome to uh, to our little humble little area here, uh, Victor. Glad we were able yeah. to get you in here for an interview. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. Of course, uh, not a problem. Um, so, as I'm sure you're aware, with many of these job interviews, we're gonna just gonna start with a few general questions, just to kind of get an idea and a feel for you as a person, and see how you would fit in with our crew. Um, so your first one, of course. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been uh, I've been looking for stuff like this for you know a long time, long time. Uh, got a bit of a history with these. Uh, I don't know. You guys call them cryptids. I call them evil, but you know. Uh, so yeah, I got a bit of history with them. Kind of know a bit about them. I've uh, been in the security business for a little while, so I've got experience there too, but, uh, you know, um, whatever you need, I've got, uh, I've got whatever kind of experience you need for, you know, looking after your crew. That's good to know. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I guess I kind of might already know the answer to this next question, but what attracted you to this job? Well, actually, I did, uh... I did kind of pay attention to the show in the past, so I, I do know a little bit of what you guys look for, but, uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna say the attraction is actually, you know, to see these, these creatures firsthand and, uh, you know, do what needs to be done to deal with them. Of course. Sense. Um, what would you say your greatest strength is? My greatest strength? Um, I would say I'm able to keep cool under pressure, uh, in my line of work, you know, in the security business, some, some stuff comes up where you got to be able to keep your calm so that you can make good decisions. And I would say, you know, from what we're doing here, uh, that might be what you need. That is definitely something that will come in handy, especially with uh, our line of work. Um, in line with that last question, of course, though, is uh, what is your greatest weakness? Oh, my greatest weakness? I don't know. I would have to say... I'm not a real 
people person uh, that could be gruff sometimes so a little abrupt maybe so sometimes I can rub people the wrong way um, but you know sometimes people see that as a strength too because you know they know where they stand and that that is fair um, of course you're not gonna have to be dealing with a lot of people other than our crew um, we don't expect you to be in the front lines of any of the investigations or anything just make sure our crew is safe um, but in line with your answer I guess uh, how would your previous colleagues describe you um, I get along pretty good with my work people it's the sometimes the companies that you're dealing with or the people you're dealing with that uh, have been the issue but uh, as far as my work people I would say you know we get along pretty good if you call up uh, any of the people on my reference sheet um, you know most of the guys are guys that I work with so I don't think you'll see any problems there fair enough I get that. that's good um, so now that's pretty much the end of our general questions there uh, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into more of the security questions considering we are hiring you on to be a security specialist so we want to make sure that you have some knowledge in that regard as well so that first sounds question fair. sounds fair uh, what strategies would you implement to ensure the safety of the team during field investigations? And this is considering the past incident with the goat man search. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, well, for one, I think everybody on the team needs to be informed. And so, you know, having uh, pre-game meetings, I like to call them, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, make sure that everybody's in communication. Uh, you know, nobody steps outside the lines without uh, without everybody knowing where everybody's at kind of thing. Uh, makes for a safe, safe environment, especially in this situation, you know, when we're out looking for these types of things. So I would say that's one of the strategies I would be using is uh, making sure that everybody is in communication at all times. No, that's definitely good. We want to make sure we have direct lines of communication at all time um, next question how how do you handle unexpected security threats threats sorry. Um, and um, what measures do you put into place to mitigate these risks during the expeditions mm. uh, without seeing the actual environment that we're working in um, I would have to say uh, you know, I'm not positive about this, of course, but, uh, you know, uh, I like to use the uh, analyze uh, theory where you, you know, analyze the situation, uh, assess the, the any threats, uh, and then neutralize um, to the best of your ability. I mean, you can't make sure everything goes the way you want because of unexpected things, but uh, if you're uh, prepared in advance for any situations that could come up then it helps to you know uh, like as you use the word mitigate any bad uh, consequences that could happen uh, minimizes them is a better word actually that is true that definitely true make sure you're very analytical and able to uh, pinpoint these things that might happen um, have you dealt with any similar high-risk scenarios in your previous roles? And if so, how did you manage them? Uh, yeah, the, I, you know, I've had uh, quite a few, actually, in my, my years of work. I um, uh, actually had to look after a, uh, I guess it was a son of a, of a uh, what do you call him, a diplomat's son and uh they were under threat so it was a it was a high risk the sun was uh you know a target and so we had to make sure that he was safe um and you know young kids they do what they want to do so we had to make sure that uh, we were you know on track keep him in line at all times so that uh, you know he wasn't a danger to himself by you know doing stupid things, but also at the same time uh, keeping watch, making sure that uh, you know nothing nothing happened to to him when we were out and about. 
Well, I'm very happy to hear that you have previous experience dealing with stupid young kids, because uh, that's going to definitely come in handy. Find out. In the... um, next question. Uh, how do you conduct a thorough risk assessment before an expedition? Uh, taking into account both known dangers and then potential unseen. Oh, I like to, as I said before, I like to pre-game. So I usually go in to the area that we're going to be working in uh, uh, either a day before or depending an hour before if I, you know, depending on the circumstances. But it's always before to see, analyze, assess, make sure that I've got, you know, the... Uh, area figured out so that I can, uh, you know, neutralize anything that's uh, a potential uh, to the best I can, and then uh, plan for anything that could possibly happen. Uh, the outside threats are kind of just, you know, like I said, I'm able to keep my cool and keep my calm as these things happen, and I can usually... Uh, make decent decisions as they happen, but you know, trying to prevent the things before they happen is uh, all preparing. And so, if you go in uh, beforehand and look at the area, assess it, you can generally, you know, minimize risks. All right, all right, good. Um, let's say, just for example, um, there's an emergency situation during an investigation. What specific steps would you take to ensure the safety of the team? And then how do you prioritize those steps? Uh, again, first off, uh, communication is key. So communicating everybody to a safe zone, uh, getting everybody there. If there's somebody that's injured, of course, getting our medical staff to deal with that so that we can move those people to the safe zone. And then from there, uh, setting up a perimeter if we have to, depending on, you know, uh, what's happening so that we can, uh, keep everybody safe during that time. Uh, again, this depends on the emergency. So I'm kind of just, uh, you know, riffing here cause I, I don't know what the emergency is. So no, no, it's just a hypothetical. I, I'm, I'm so yeah, exactly. Anything. And I'm just kind of going by what we're we're looking into, of course, you know. 100%. I, I fully understand, and you don't have to worry about it. That was a great answer. Um, could you describe to me some of the communication systems and protocols you would establish? That way we can maintain contact and coordination with the team. And this is especially in remote or isolated areas. Considering our next mission is going to be in the Northwest Territories, we're going to be dealing with a lot of remote and isolated areas. Yeah, so to me, this is more of a tech question because uh, I don't know what the budget is for this whole endeavor. Uh, the higher the budget, the better the communication can be, of course. So I'm going to assume that we're going to have... Uh, some kind of satellite phones or we're going to have some kind of uh, uh what's it called like uh, long distance or long range radios that we can keep in contact ideally if we could have like earpieces that we can all communicate on that way it's better because then your hands are free but uh again that's a more of a budget question uh, i can get us set up with whatever equipment we need so that we can have easy contact between each other but uh, it just depends on the budget. Well, you don't have to worry about budget at all. Like, as you know about the show, the show was quite successful. Before. And we do have a, a hefty budget that we can work with just to make sure that everybody's safe. And everything works out for us in the future here. So don't worry about that. But you did mention some very good items that we can use. So we're all good. Um, next question. Uh, how do you strike a balance between providing security measures and allowing the investigative team the freedom needed for their work? Um, so how would you how would you say you could balance that? Uh, yeah, we're more hands like when I say hands off, I mean we keep ourselves at a distance. We're close enough to make sure that we can, uh, you know, get in there if we need to, but far enough away that we won't be. In the picture as it were or in their way so i understand what you're saying i mean that's a bit of a, a fine line but uh again preparation 
uh, seeing where we need to be, uh, knowing where the crew is going to be, and then assess the situation, analyze, and uh, basically uh, uh, put my two cents in, I guess, as where they, where dangers might be so they know, and then uh, just watching and making sure, again, with the communication that they can uh, minimize the risk to themselves. Great. That's a good idea. Um, in your previous roles, can you provide a example, an example of a high risk situation you successfully navigated, uh, highlighting the specific strategies and precautions that you employ? Hmm, that's a good question. Sometimes, uh, uh, in my line of work, you kind of throw all caution to the wind too, to, to make sure that you, uh, keep the person that you're, your, I guess they call your detail person you're taking, looking after safe. And so, uh, uh, there was one time when, uh, one of the people, uh, we were looking after, uh, had a, uh, stalker. And so we had to watch closely and that stalker got inside our perimeter. We knew who the stalker was. Uh, we knew where our perimeter was and uh they breached that perimeter and so uh not only do we have to take down that person um not not kill them or anything just take them down safely but uh make sure that our uh person that we were looking after was uh rushed out of that uh area so that they were uh didn't have to deal with that situation and so, as I'm saying, I'm uh, not using any names because this person was a famous person, but um, just so you kind of are aware of the, some of the details. So yes, it was, that one was successfully uh, resolved. Nobody was hurt. Um, and that person was grateful that uh, uh, the, the stalker was uh, brought to, I guess you'd call it justice. Excellent. I, I'd love to know more about it, but I assume confidentiality is everything. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that one was a, an NDA, so... No, no problem, I understand. Um, how do you approach the logistical planning of security measures for an expedition? Uh, what considerations do you take into account, and how do you adapt plans to different environments? Just for example, uh, we're going to be going into the Northwest Territories, so use that use that as a as a premise uh so i mean the the land up there is either heavily forested or super barren so depending on which way or what we're near um it's going to uh need different things of course and so just as long as we know where we're going um you can kind of prepare based on uh the area that you're in and so the logistics of it again all comes down to budget which you've said uh, there's no uh budget issue uh so really we can have whatever we need to take care of that and the other thing about that too is uh, time of year uh northwest territories can be fairly cold uh depending on when this is taking place i'm not sure so um Oh, we'll be, uh, uh, we're planning on starting filming in about two weeks, three weeks. All right, so, yeah, we should be, we should be fine. We know, we know what we're getting into, just uh, preparing properly for the weather and uh, having all the tools at our disposal that we need to make sure everybody's safe. And uh, again, a little bit of emergency supplies just in case anything goes uh, south. Fair. Okay. Um, and then how do you establish and maintain positive relationships with local authorities and law enforcement to ensure a cooperative and supportive environment for teams for the team's investigations? Um, where we're going to be going, it's a small sheriff's department. Population of the town is only about 500. So uh, it's going to be a very tight knit community. How would you establish and maintain that relationship? 
Oh, again, if uh, if I'm hired, I like to go in, you know, a little bit before the whole crew goes in just to do exactly that. Uh, all those um, local authorities are very important to to all of us for our safety and for the safety of the crew. And so I like to go in, meet the sheriff uh, and his and his staff, uh, depending on how many there are, get to know them a little bit just to let them know what we're up to so they're not, uh, you know, um, come uh, surprised when we show up. Uh, but also I like to check out the local hospitals or clinics, stuff like that, whatever they have, uh, just to make sure that we, they're aware that, you know, things could happen and in case they need anything, again, we can, we can supply a little bit of the stuff they might need just in case. So, uh, you know, Northwest Territories, most of those places are actually pretty, uh, pretty well stocked for all that stuff, but it's good to just check in. So just making sure that, you know, everybody's uh, in the know of uh, the fact that we're coming, uh, what we're up to so that they know that, uh, you know, things could happen. And uh, that way they're prepared if we, you know, have to put the call in for any help. Excellent. Um, this final question uh, is a little bit to do with technology again. Um, so... What are some of the latest tools and systems that you use to enhance the safety of the investigative? How would you incorporate? Them? Uh, this, like you said, uh, this all comes back to communication. The more people uh, can be uh, with each other, um, yeah, not physically, but, you know, in contact, uh, it can solve a lot of problems because the... Uh, if you can tell people, you know, that they're straying off the path or if they're if they're a little too far away for you to see, but, you know, they can still hear you and you know what's going on, you can get to them quick enough. And that's really all it is about is making sure that you're uh, there in time to deal with stuff. And so uh, my biggest thing for anything is all about communication. So having the best communication devices that we possibly can have so that there's no downtime, no dead time. Uh, and in the Northwest Territories, that satellite equipment is the best. Um, I'm assuming that uh, if they've got a good budget, the camera equipment's going to be excellent. Uh, so tapping into that uh, camera equipment so that we can have an eye, we see what they're seeing kind of thing is very helpful. Um, so all those all those things make make our jobs easier as security people. Um, being able to know what they're doing, where they are, uh, how far away they are, uh, uh, what their frame of mind is uh, in the situation that they're in. All those, all those things help. And so, uh, you know, I could sit here and I could talk about weapons and guns and all those things, but really um, those things aren't the most important when you're doing security. It's, it's, uh, sight and sound, communication, and being able to see uh, your uh, your uh, detail, your person you're looking after, um, and especially in an area like you know the Northwest Territories, you know I really don't see a lot of threats from outside stuff. It's more the stuff that we're looking at that I'm uh, concerned about. Well, I I will say um, you, just so you're aware of what the position will entail. Uh, you're going to be with them uh, practically 24-7. However, basically when you come back to home base, uh, we're going to be staying at the Nahani Lodge. Once you come back to home base, you will have your own separate room. Um, however, with the actual filming and everything, you will be with them just outside of camera. So we just want to make sure that we don't have any more incidents and things go smoothly and we don't have to worry about any of our crew um, that being said that's all my questions uh, do you have any questions for me um, well since this is going to be filmed in the Northwest Territories um, is there going to be uh, North Pay Extreme North Pay uh, yes of course but you okay. don't have to really worry about that either because you'll be getting paid more than you would at a normal job because you're going to be part of a famous film crew fingers crossed oh, that's that's that sounds good that sounds good i'm i'm okay with that um 
All right. Well, uh, you know, I look forward. Hopefully this uh, works out. I look forward to working with you guys and uh, meeting the crew and uh, and uh, protecting you guys. Uh, I'd, I'd like to do that. All right. Well, we, we have a few more interviews to get through, uh, but we will let you know either way. A uh, couple of days here. Is All right. No, that sounds good. Is Maxine here? Cool. Oh, you'll be fine. All right. Um, next in, Maxine. Um, hey, uh, how's it going? Um, my name is Tom. Obviously, you know why you're here today. We're uh, interviewing you for our lead investigator role on the search. So um, we're just going to start things off with a couple of normal, general questions for most job interviews. Um, first question, of course. Uh, tell me something about yourself. Well, I grew up uh, in a, I'd say, medium-sized uh, city in northern Manitoba. Oh, and, which one? Uh, Thompson. Oh, my my mom's from there. Sorry, go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt. Anyway, there's a lot of crazy stuff that went on there. And it's like, yeah, that's up, for sure. Yes, a lot of different things that went on up there. And it was, yeah, it was, it was not always the best uh, place to grow up, but you got to meet a lot of interesting characters. And yeah, I uh, got to hear some different stories from people. You have a large surrounding of people that are, uh, I don't know. They think a little bit differently up there, I think. And I'm guessing that you know that already. Yes. But, I... Yeah. But, uh, yeah, talking to them, different things, it was like, I I was always trying to figure out whether the stories they told were actually true or not, or or different things like that. So I, I kind of got into investigating at a, at a young age. There was always different things going on there that were just... You had to figure out what was real and what wasn't. And so that kind of got me going down that path. And and it was something that I liked and I was pretty good at. So I kept going with it. And that's that's kind of what drew me to this to this uh, job. It was like, this is this is something that I like to do. And I have been doing it for a while now. And yeah, I really enjoy it. I like digging into things and seeing what's what's real and what's not, because there's a lot of garbage out there. So, yeah, I figured well, this would be something I'd like to try. That is a, a great answer, and I guess it kind of answers my next question as well, um, which is what attracted you to this job? So I guess you kind of already said that, but I, is there anything else? Well, just, yeah, this just seemed like a different type of job that... Uh, looking into stuff so it's like yeah i wanted to see what if we could dig into it a little bit more and and go down that road and yeah it was a new place it's like i like to travel and like to go to different places and yeah this seems to be it's a little farther north than i've been in a long time so yeah i wanted to uh see what what's out there and see what kind of stuff we can get into and like i said i like i like seeing what's real and what's not so that's that's kind of my whole thing because it's like there is a lot of nonsense out there but no i like to i like to uh investigate and check out things and talk to lots of people and yeah people like to talk to me so i i think i kind of have a knack for this type of thing all right um so ne next question uh, what mm -hmm. would you say your greatest strength is? I don't like to give up. I like to, um, it's like a, a dog with a bone. It's like, I just, I want to get to the bottom of something. So it's like, yeah, I, I don't usually let anything lie. It's like, I want to, I want to keep going until I get to the end. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. All right. Um, and then in line with that last question, what would you say your greatest weakness is? Uh, probably the same type of thing, because sometimes it's like things that takes up a lot of time and yeah, 
sometimes it's it it can almost overtake everything in my life and that's kind of why I've just kept to myself type of thing because it's like relationships things like that it's like I just I keep digging and digging and it's like some people don't like that so yeah that's the that's the hard part of this job it's like you've got to get to the truth no matter no matter what happens so yeah it's good and bad I guess so that's I guess would be a weakness and a strength yeah I think that's it all right um in previous jobs how would your mm -hmm. previous colleagues describe you driven um tenacious uh yeah i yeah sometimes i just plow through things and it's like yeah they might some people might think that that's that's uh a little hard to deal with but i just i don't i don't like to let anything just go to the side i want i want to get to the bottom of things and it's like it just it drives me crazy it's something that i can't stop thinking about until till i get to the bottom of something so yeah i think that's how they would describe me it's like i'm not i'm not gonna rest until i deal with whatever we're dealing with so yeah i'd say that okay um perfect uh so that's pretty much the end of our general questions um mm -hmm. The next question for you is more in the sense of your job role. Um, so you, can you share your experience with conducting investigations into cryptid sightings or mysterious phenomena? Um, yeah, dealing with different people. Yeah, trying to figure out things. It's like most stuff I've, I've, anything that I've investigated so far, I haven't really found anything that's uh real generally it's some kind of hoax or it's some kind of uh phenom yeah like people have misheard or misseen or not misseen that's not the right word but it's like there's been some other reason for it so it's like yeah but i'm willing to keep on looking i'm willing to keep on searching because yeah so far everything there's been a legitimate answer to it so it's like i know that there will be some strange things out there but it's like i don't like people that are faking things or trying to scam people or that type of thing so it's like yeah i get to the bottom of stuff like that and it's like i'm not always popular in that in that degree but it's like that's that's how it goes it's like this is this is who I am and it's like I just want the truth that's all I want and it's like I keep going until until I find it and it's like one day I'm sure there might be something that I don't like but that's that's the whole thing that's figuring this stuff out all right chasing the truth mm -hmm. how do you handle high pressure situations especially when faced with potential dangers during field work well i'd like to say that i go at it uh with some caution because it's like growing up in that area like up in thompson it was like yeah there was some dangerous people around and it's like you have to be careful but at the same time it's like i i watch myself i watch my back and it's like in people that i work with it's like i look for people i can trust and it's like i'm i'm going to stick by them if they stick by me and it's like yeah you look for people that are are on the same side as you it's like people that can back you and it's like i'll back them as well so it's like yeah being cautious but at the same time it's like sticking to what you need to do and and uh going from there that type of thing perfect uh, what skills or techniques do you believe are essential for separating legitimate claims from the hoax? Well, for me, it's, yeah, it's a lot of research. It's like, you don't just go by what, what people say, but it's like, um, I use the internet for some stuff and I know that anything can be on the internet, but it's like, I like doing research and books and talking to people and it's like, trying to 
uh, figure out what's real from unreal, like in talking to people. It's like more than one witness type of thing because everybody sees things a little bit differently. So it's like trying to accumulate all the information that I can possibly get, go through and just keep looking through it and see if there's any discrepancies or that type of thing. And I just, I just keep at it until I can come to a conclusion that makes sense. So it's like, I don't, I don't just take the first person's word of things. And I don't just take the first thing that I see on the internet. It's like, yeah, sometimes you have to look through files or newspapers or old school as opposed to the internet but yeah and talking to people too because it's like people will people will reveal some things a little more the more you talk to them so it's like just getting everybody's uh, account of different things and putting it all together that's how I that's how I generally deal with stuff perfect make sure that everything you uh, come across is factual and Right? And yeah, I like to back to it up. Yeah. Um, describe to me a situation where you had to make a critical decision during an investigation. Um, what factors did you consider and uh, what was the outcome? Oh, just a case off the top of my head. I, yeah. Different things like, like for myself, I'm always. I'm always skeptical about different things like if I if I can't see it or feel it myself so it's like when you're looking for a different how did you word it again um a high pressure or sorry a critical decision during an investigation and then what factors you considered and what was the outcome um well always trying to find out the truth I I can't yeah I'm having a hard time just trying to think of something off the top of my head here okay I yeah I we, didn't I didn't go ahead it's okay we can come back to that question later okay um next question in okay. cases where your investigations cross paths with the local authorities how do you ensure a cooperative and respectful relationship especially in sensitive or remote locations um where we're going to be going is a small town known as glacier ridge that's a population of only about 500 and they have a very small sheriff's department and a couple deputies um so how would you maintain a relationship with such a sensitive community Generally, when I go into places where, yeah, where they have a very small police force or that type of thing, it's like I do try to become friendly with them because it's like, you know, you're coming into their territory, so you don't really want to, you know, step on any toes. But yeah, I try to just maintain things on a friendly level because it's like you can kind of feel them out. And it's like sometimes that's been great. And it's like I've had decent relationships with with different officers of the law, but other times it's like, yeah, you're still dealing with, I guess, uh, hurt feelings because they feel like you're, well, this is their territory, you shouldn't be, you know, what are they doing wrong? You know, like egos get involved, but generally it's been going pretty good. But it's like, yeah, you just treat them with respect and you come in there and you you try to abide by you know their rules but at the same time it's like you make friends with the locals and it's like you can kind of feel out like what the what the authorities are like in that area pretty quick so yeah you just have to be careful not to step on any toes and just talk to people that's what i find is like talking to people is is the best is the best idea and it's like yeah don't don't go in thinking that you're going to solve everything right off the cuff. It's like you want to you want to be helpful and you want their help and it's like, you know, you're not you're not trying to go in there for, you know, the glory or whatever it is like that. It's like, you know, they they can deal with with any of the the re
Sorry, you cut out there. I think you may have muted the Zoom call. What? You muted yourself. How did I mute myself? I didn't touch anything. Am okay, I well, back on? Yeah, you're good now. But you cut, oh. and then there was no noise coming from you. Oh, I don't know what happened. Because, yeah, I didn't do anything. I was just sitting here. Okay. Uh, so what did, what did you catch? Uh, I think you were pretty much done. It was just you. Yeah. Um, yeah. As the lead investigator, uh, mm -hmm. clear communication with your team is crucial. How right. do you ensure that effective communication during field work? How do you handle disagreements or conflicting opinions within the team? Uh, you don't want to ruffle any feathers. So it's like, yeah, you... I, it's like for myself, I like to have, you know, things kind of uh, like a list of things that I want to accomplish or different people that I want to, you know, like who's talking to this person or who's got, but it's like making sure that you are not overly demanding. And it's like, again, just like with the authorities in the area, it's like you want to show respect to each other. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, you want to keep everybody on the same page and it's like sometimes of course they're gonna have a different opinion so it's like yeah you just you don't get don't get uh upset or annoyed but it's like yeah kind of see where they're at too because it's like some people are just going to have a different opinion and it's like making sure that you have lots of discussions and talk to each other and yeah keep the lines of communication open so that you know you know what's going on and it's like you know, meeting. Sorry, it might be my internet connection cut out again. It's happening yeah, on my side too. Uh, so it's your internet that's cutting out a little bit. It cut out at needing. Me? Yes. I don't know why my. Yeah. Uh. I was saying about needing to have like, you know, daily updates type of thing to make sure that everybody's on, you know, where did they get to it, so that everybody knows what's going on. Cause it's like, I don't want to hide anything from anybody type of thing. It's like making sure those lines of communication are open. And it's like, yeah, I haven't really had an issue with that, but it's like, maybe this team will see. It's like, hopefully everybody can can you know stay on the same page and because yeah our ultimate theme is to get to the bottom of whatever mystery there is exactly um so how would you say your experience as a private investigator it has prepared you for leading investigations into cryptids and mysterious phenomena on the search the fact it's like i've been doing it for years it's like with like i said talking to people getting in there finding out what different opinions are different not necessarily opinions but to see what different people have seen or how they feel about stuff or it's like if they have any suspicions or that type of thing and then just making sure that you put in the work it's like don't just don't just take the first thing that comes along it's like putting in the work making sure like i said earlier that things are backed up by facts and by different things like that and it's like you know um it's it's worked all this time and it's like yeah you just keep you just keep digging because eventually it comes out it's like it may take some time but you just don't give up it's like if you give up it's like you're never going to get the answers that you need all right um and then as a private investigator you have likely navigated legal boundaries how are you going to ensure that the search investigation conducted with legal, within legal and ethical parameters, especially when dealing with potentially dangerous situations? Well, legal, it's like, I feel like our legalities across Canada are pretty much the same. I would have to check into that with authorities as to like what we're allowed, but it's like, yeah, it's like sometimes, yeah, you may skirt the line a little bit but it's like yeah you don't want to push it too much because 
yeah, again, with the authorities, it's like, you know, you have to be able to get things in a in a way that doesn't cause too many problems because yeah if you do something and it's not kosher it's what good is it to you if you can't show people like the right way just like with a legal thing like a legal case it's like you need to do things the right way in a in a way that the authorities are all happy with it because if they're going to prove something then they need the right backing like the right uh evidence the right yeah and it's like and if you do something illegally then it's like you just screw the whole the whole case basically and that's no good to anybody so exactly. and ethically with ethically it's like yeah that's that's a fine line for everybody too so it's like just making sure that you're not doing anything where that you don't agree with that's not going to be good for people so yeah yeah and considering this is going to be our big comeback we definitely don't want to be shutting the show down early by any correct so i just wanted yeah. to clarify because um, i'm guessing that you have lawyers that would have anything for us you know that they don't want us to do or don't you know type of things that we don't want to get into i would assume i mean yes and no there are like we can go into whatever we want it's an internet show um right but if we come across some things that might need to hold off on then we talk talk to them and get some stuff set up um in what ways do you believe you, the skills you acquired as a private investiga investigator directly contribute to your effectiveness as the lead investigator for a show focused on uncovering cryptid evidence? Well, I think the years that I've put in, because it's like I've been doing this for a long time. Like I know I was a kid for some of it, but, but yeah, I've been doing it for quite some time and, and, and I've built up some uh sources with and it's like maybe not in this area but they can do research for me wherever they are and it's like yeah i've got friends friends around that i can call on that uh that can help in those areas and yeah and it's like i i enjoy working with people but it's like especially if if they have the same goal because it's like and that's as part of this team it's like i would hope that we all have the same goal so it's like it just makes it so much easier when you have people working together for the same outcome so yeah i would hope that and like i said just with my different sources and different the way that i deal with people and in talking to people and different things like that it's like i would hope that that it would contribute to uh the end result of whatever we're looking for good good um so that is all the questions that we have for you um of course it is an interview but we can go both right. ways do you have any questions for us so yeah it's like have you established any sources in town or like are there people that you wanting us to talk to or are we just coming in there like no specific cool. sources in town. We have set everything up and ready to go. We will be staying at the Nahani Lodge. We have uh, basically reserved their banquet room for the next month. Um, however, they're not very busy. Very small town. And they just built a new hunting lodge in town, so that's much more popular than the Nahani Lodge. Um, uh -huh. But... I've already established contact with the owner of the lodge and we are good to go for our rooms, banquet room. I've spoken with the shuttle driver who's going to take us from Fort Simpson to Glacier Ridge. Um, so yeah, that's that's all set up and good to go. However, setting up sources in town, nothing yet. Hoping that as we produce the show a little bit more, more people will come out with their stories and things like that. And have we have we touched base with authorities in in this place or no? Not uh, as of yet. No, not yet. Okay. And like I know this is sad, but like internet access and things like that, or it's like 
very limited, uh, but okay. we do have access. Okay. No, then that should be good then, because it's like, yeah, it's it's just getting feet on the ground and that type of thing, talking to people right off the kip then. And it's like getting getting established in the area and making our presence known type of thing, but not too much because it's like, yeah, I find sometimes if we go in there, you know, um, metaphorically guns blazing, but it's like, but yeah, it's more getting to know people, getting to see the layout of the, of the place that we're in. So, and seeing who's who and, and what they know, I think would be what we'd want to do right off the, right at the start. Exactly. Well, um, if that's all your questions, then, uh, we have a couple more interviews to do, but we'll keep in contact with you and let you know either way in a couple days here. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. You all get a call back within the next two days saying, hey, you've been hired for the job. Uh, not you, of course, Wyatt, because why would he? Um, it just wanted to be known that I rolled to see if I was successful privately and I rolled two ones. <laughs> Perfect. So we all know that we have replaced Charlie with another person named Charlie. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So, I'm gonna just send you a uh, word document on Discord because I don't want to pull out Facebook. Just send it to the group chat. Um, no. <laughs> just I a mean, quick. I could. <clears throat> just a quick question, actually. Now that I'm kind of curious about it, um, where are you from, Charlie? Uh, Alberta. You're from Alberta? Yeah. Up around Edmonton. Okay. Or in then, Edmonton. I forget specifically, but... And then, uh... Wyatt? Uh, that's a good question. Saskatchewan. Michigan. Oh, you're from the States, too. No, that doesn't work, because this show doesn't... It shows not from the States. Sorry. In, uh, Alberta. You just okay. Um, all right. So, so like that yeah. happened because he doesn't know the provinces well enough. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Saskatchewan. If memory serves, Alberta is the Texas of uh, Canada. It is. That is. True. That is true. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I, that was a choice. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so you all meet up at the Calgary airport. Big one in in Alberta. Calgary is bigger than Edmonton, so yeah. it makes sense. So you all go to the uh, Calgary Airport, and that is where you meet up with Frankie. Oh, uh, he's got your you sign. You see a person walking towards you in like. Uh, I'm gonna go with like a gray tank top. They've got a uh, dark green army jacket on with um, black Jenko jeans that are tucked into some green Doc Martens. Um, their hair is kind of like a mullet style but they've got like neon green like bangs and like it kind of goes underneath a little bit um it, uh, madison share the character art while she's saying it okay uh they've Sorry. definitely made it a a little more difficult like you aren't 100 percent sure is this a guy is this a girl you're not really sure on first glance and they just have like a um, I think you can drag and drop. Uh, it might break things. And walking through the airport, they've just kind of got... Um, actually, I'm going to use these. I'm going to wear these. There we go. Um, and they just have, like, one kind of... I 
don't know what you would call it. It's not like an army sack, but it's like... Not a backpack, not a duffel bag. Rucksack. That's the word I couldn't think of. They've just kind of got a rucksack that's... You can kind of see some stuff is like poking out of it over one shoulder as they're walking towards you. That. That's what Frank. Roughly. Some something like that. It's what it gave us. All right. Oh, hey, uh, uh, Frankie. Um, welcome. This is this is the crew so far. Um, I'm gonna pretend like uh, Victor and Maxine have already done their interviews. Um, so this here, uh, this is Charlie. He's our security specialist. Um, another security specialist. This is Victor. Um, our lead investigator is Maxine here. Um, Wyatt, he's been with the crew for a long time. He's going to be our camera person. He's going to be our camera person. Uh, and then camera person. crew, everyone, uh, this is this is Frankie. Stop. Uh, kind of showing up late because flight connections are shit. You see me walk up, tall guy, reddish brown hair, uh, long, apparently quite handsome according to the picture. <laughs> uh, wearing a sweater with a jean jacket and a backpack, just walking up. Um, and here is Charlie. Hello. Frankie. All right. Uh, you guys can get to know each other on the plane or uh, on camp, whatever you want. But we're going to gather everybody up. Our flight takes off in about ooh, uh, 30 minutes, so we got to go. Yeah. Are you going to drag a picture of... Uh... Do you want me to drag pictures of everybody? Yeah, you want to drag one for Wyatt? Sure. Uh... Wyatt's a uh, small kid. Wyatt. Uh, Wyatt is uh, a little uh, small for his age. You're you're kind of quiet there, by the way. Oh, my quiet. Oh, sorry. Um. Uh. So Wyatt's uh, a little, a little kind of a small kid. He's small for his age. Uh, he's got dark wavy hair. Um. Looks like he's seen some things because he has. Um, while probably not at the airport, he tends to carry around his stuffed animal. Uh, it's an old raggedy beat up teddy bear that his parents gave him when he was a kid. And it's kind of what, uh, helps him stay sane. You said, make it sound like these guys are abusing you. They're really not. <laughs> oh no, I'm not saying that they are. This just. It's a, you know, a kid who's going through some stuff and uh, has kind of a bad attitude sometimes. Okay. So, uh, on the left, on the stream. Oh, I just realized I'm not on the stream. Okay. So, on the stream right now, on the left, that is Charlie. On the right, that is Wyatt. That's it. Um, okay. So, you guys all gather up and you head towards your plane. Um, once you realize, though, you are not going on a normal plane. As they lead you outside of the airport, down onto the uh, airstrip, and start walking you towards just a regular old prop plane. The hell is this? Um, well, we're heading to a very small, maybe not even airport. Uh, we're heading to a airstrip with a building on it. So Fine. they don't take like passenger planes. They take these small passenger planes. 
Um, as you walk up towards the plane, uh, you realize there is about eight seats on it. Not including the captains. Well, Fine. as long as it can stay in the air. So there's the, there's the five of you. So there's Charlie, Frankie, Wyatt, Victor, Maxine on the plane. And then there's the three producers or the crew members who were remaining. <clears throat> Welcome to uh, Air Canada's finest. Oh, Air Canada doesn't fly here. It's flare. It's like calm air, bearskin air, something like that. Uh, no, it, it's being facetious. I know. Uh, but yeah, this is we'll we'll go with bearskin. Um. Okay. So everybody, this is going to be a bit of a bumpy ride, but hey, we're not too far out. It's only going to be about mm, two hours. Sound good? And today's air in-flight movie is going to be Jaws, followed There's... by uh, the Gremlins version of Twilight Zone. I was hoping for Sit down online. and put in headphones just to tune out the annoying kid. There is no movies, um, so just try to sleep, relax, whatever you want. Anyway, um, so good luck. So the plane takes off and it's very bumpy. It's a very rocky ride. Um, and as you're going along, um, you're looking down across Canada and seeing the lovely trees and rocks and water that we have in Canada <laughs> and as you're flying out this way you're seeing less and less <laughs> civilization and more and more nature you just got a song stuck in my head you're welcome I knew I would <laughs> um okay so I keep on looking at my phone so that I can see if uh, Victor and Maxine are gonna show up but I don't know if um Okay, so as you guys are, does anybody want to talk to each other or no? They just want to chill. Um, I'm going to lean over to the kid. Okay. And just like, like not even like super like, hey, excuse me. I'm just going to like tap his arm. How does a kid learn to use a... TV camera. So they tell you they're not gonna feed you unless you take a video for them anymore, and you learn real quick, otherwise you get real hungry? Huh. That was not one of the things that happened in my foster homes. No? Uh, no. yeah, this is- I never was in a foster home, but I've lived with them for the last couple of years. Why? Oh, they didn't tell you? I mean, I have theories, but I got the TV answer. Oh. Wyatt, that's enough. We're gonna need to find out a, eventually what really happened. There was an unfortunate accident that has been fixed, and they've hired correctional, I mean, security officers to ensure nothing like it ever occurs again. And it's amazing and the show is the best security ever and it's going to be wonderful. Um, they're just going to lean back, throw their sunglasses down and go, I knew someone died. Take a nap. Okay. Uh, so. Of, of, of course not. No, 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 no nobody died. It was a small inconvenience, minor setback, nothing of any consequence. Everything's fine now. What is the monster of a week equivalent of? Uh... <laughs> Whatever you oh, say. Is it? Are you talking about an insight check? Yes, that's the word. <laughs> um... So I feel like with that execution, it's not needed. <laughs> No, everybody knows what actually happened. It's just the, the official answer is this. Um, okay. 
Okay, so. I mean, if you were actually wanting to figure it out, it would kind of be... Either investigate a mystery or read a bad situation. But, again, it doesn't matter, because everybody knows what actually happened. I just keep trying to get someone to admit it. Um, okay, so, after about two hours of flying, the plane starts going down. Not aggressively, but <laughs> landing. <laughs> um, and then you guys land. <laughs> And as you're looking out the window, as you're coming down, all you see is like a small building, a field, and a tiny little strip of like asphalt or tarmac, I guess. All right. Um, well, everyone, welcome to Fort Simpson. Uh, this is where we're going to be meeting our shuttle driver who's going to drive us to Glacier Ridge. Middle of nowhere. Hey, Fort I mean, Fort Simpson has a population. Homer? What's that? Fort Simpson. You think we'll meet Homer? No, I don't think so. Uh, so Fort Simpson actually does have a population of about a thousand people. Where we're going has a population of about 500 or so. So, um, let's wait for the pilots to let us off, and then we can head on our way to the pickup area. So the pilot gets up, allows you out of the plane, and you all walk across the tarmac into the field, into the airport. I put airport in quotes because it's a building. <laughs> So oh, I they uh, they take you in there. Uh, you pick up your bags, and you head outside in front of the building. And there is two vehicles there, um, both parked and with no one in them. You guys are kind of just waiting there, and Tom's like, "He said I told him what time our plane was getting out, and he's not here yet." So, I guess we just wait for another five minutes or so, and then see what happens. Um, anybody know any funny stories or anything? Oh, Wyatt, no. no. <laughs> All right, perfect gonna stand in awkward silence and see how that goes um just as uh tom says that see a large van pull up with a bunch of seats in the back um an elderly gentleman do you actually think i can drag and drop you should be able to Sorry, everyone. I'm learning that I can actually do stuff here. An elderly gentleman who is now on screen uh, hops out of the front of the vehicle. Uh, and as he hops out, he uh, has a big smile on his face and he's like, hello, everyone. Welcome to Fort Simpson. Sorry that I took so long to get here. I was uh, helping with the fire season preparation. Um, I hope your flight was okay. Uh, I know some of these charter flights can be a bit bumpy, but my name is Robert. My friends call me Bob. You guys can call me Bob. Uh, I'm the shuttle, shuttle driver around here. Hi, Bob. Our wings didn't fly off, so it was a good flight. Well, isn't that great, Sonny? Um, now, 
don't you worry. Uh, it is a bit of a drive to Glacier Ridge and a bumpy one at that. So just try to, your best to get comfortable and I'll do my best to fill you in on some of the details of the place while we try to make our way to the quaint little village. So, uh, you all aren't from around here, I understand that, but um, welcome to the Northwest Territories. And he grabs your bags, pops them in the back of the van, and you all take off. Uh, again, it's a bit of awkward silence while driving. If you guys want to fill that silence, you can. If not, too. Cool. Uh, so, uh, you guys. A great story. I'll... You guys drive for about uh, 15, 20 minutes in awkward silence. Uh, Bob's kind of just humming a tune to himself on the radio. Um, and as he is driving, he notices that there's not a whole lot going on. So he turns down the radio. And he's like, so you guys are all heading to Glacier Ridge. Well, to start off, Glacier Ridge is a small village of a few hundred people. Not a lot goes on there, although they do, like a lot of other rural communities, have a few kooks around town. Nothing too crazy, of course. Uh, a couple of flat earthers, a few conspiracy theorists. Well, and I guess the cult thing they had too, um, but they're mostly harmless, I think at least. What uh, cult? There was a cult. I don't know. They did some investigating, but nothing came of it. Um, their whole thing is Dionysus, you know, the the wine god, um, the one mm -hmm. that's drunk all the time. Supposedly, he's there to help with harvest and stuff, too, so they do their thing, and they're supposed to get fresh fruits and veggies out of the deal. Other than that, not a whole lot of crazies. It's a very small minority of the town, uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about it, you know? Oh, um, right. now, you said your plan was to take some videos of the forest, right? Well, I will let you know the Nuhani Valley is very beautiful this time of year. Uh, or any time of year, to be honest. But you just gotta be careful, you know? Uh, they've had some animal attacks around here. Lots of bears. Some wolves. Some mountain lions. Oh, oh, uh, just a little tip. Uh, it's the law around here for everyone to keep their doors unlocked. Uh, car doors, that is. Uh, that way, if you ever have a polar bear or mountain lion or whatever chasing you, you can just hop into the closest car quick as you can, and uh, that'll give you a little bit of safety and security and shelter. Um, additionally, a couple of years ago, they built some of these small shelters around that you can use for the same type of thing. Just go in there if something's chasing you, and uh, <clears throat> you'll have security, you know? Are the shel shelters built out into the forest? Uh, they're built in locations that they actually did some research on to find best areas to put them in make sure that it provided the most safety safety to everyone. So you'll see some random small buildings around. Uh, they'll have like little animal signs on the front of them. So those are the places you go into. Swing open the door, lock it from the inside, and then you're good to go. Good to know. I'm sorry, did you say there's polar bears in Canada? Yes. You're not from around here at all, are you? From Ohio. Yeah, there's polar bears in Canada. Hmm. Quite a few, things. actually. List of things I didn't know. There are a lot. More up towards the uh, Churchill area, but they travel. Oh, and by the way, um, if you're planning on going into the woods, uh, just remember there are some ruins in the woods. And if you come across them, you're only about an hour north of town. Uh, the locals in town use it as sort of a landmark. Um, so just keep an eye out for it if you're ever lost, and it'll help you find your way back home. Hmm. What else? What else? Oh, and... I didn't really want to bring this up, but I feel like maybe I should warn you. They have their guy, so don't worry about it. 
He's locked up in the Fort Simpson police station, actually. Uh, but there may still be some cleanup going out in the woods um, where they found a bit of a body dump. Not a big deal. The guy's been arrested, so everything is fine. Now, not to be presumptuous or anything, but you all don't really look like the pilgrimage type. But the monastery is still a very nice place to visit. Uh, they don't let you in or anything, but it's still very pretty. Surrounding area, uh, the building's very nice looking. They keep the area well maintained. Um, so if you're here to shoot video of the forest and how nice it is, I definitely recommend this spot. Um, it's a little bit off the beaten path uh, in the woods to the east. Quite big, so you shouldn't have a problem finding it. Um, hmm. Oh, oh weird. And Story another thing. Exciting. Oh, oh uh, actually, specifically, um, I don't know if this is your thing. Maybe your thing, little man. Um, but if you're into some of the spookier stuff in town, there's a few places to check out. Uh, there's a tree just outside of town that got hit by some lightning once during a storm. Got all burnt, and now the tree looks like a raven. And you know what that means, right, little man? Ravens mean death. Ooh, spooky stuff. Oh, oh, and, uh, and another thing for you. There's a lake to the south of town. There's a big old rock formation or something in the middle of it. Um, if you look at it just the right way, you can see it totally looks like a skull. That spooky enough for you, little man? The most spooky. Perfect. Oh, look, there, now, um, if you look out the left there, um, you can see the Albatross Industries Lumber Mill. The Albatross family is actually the last remaining founding family that stuck around in Glacier Ridge. Their old man actually just got themselves into a heap of trouble. Um, I'm not supposed to say this, but remember how I said they got... Nope. Nope, Bob, uh, you're going to get yourself in trouble again. Let's just say that Vincenzo Albatross is going to be living the rest of his days in a cell. Hmm. If no, you... Bob, tell us the story. No, no, no. I'll, uh, I'll get myself in trouble. It's fine. Um, he won't let anyone know you told us. I, I've got in trouble before, so we're not going to go with that. Um... If you are at all hunt interested in hunting, um, they do have a brand new hunting lodge that just got built. Um, it's known as the Jebediah Memorial Hunting Lodge. Um, it's actually named after a boy who went missing about two years ago. Uh, bears got him, or so the story goes. Uh, it's too bad. He was a nice kid, but that just goes to show you. The woods are dangerous, little man. That's a good thing you all brought some muscle with you. He points at uh, Charlie and Victor. You know, you're actually uh, in luck that you're coming now. Uh, they actually just finished upgrading and working out all the kinks in their new hydro station. They got working power now that's more reliable, not going out like it used to. Used to be everyone had a generator that got used pretty much weekly due to the power outage. But luckily, we got all the power poles up, no thanks to Mad Max and his crew, but those firebugs have been run out of town now. Anyway, looks like we're here. So uh, I'm going to drop you all off at the Nahani Lodge. That's where you're staying, right? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Best place in town. Only place in town? Nope. There's the hunting oh, lodge, the Jebediah time. Memorial Hunting Lodge. There's... Oh, yeah, uh, you'll find out as you drive. Um, yeah, there's the Jebediah Memorial Hunting Lodge, which does have rooms to stay in. There's Turner's Pub that also has rooms to stay in. And then uh, the Nahani Lodge is where you guys are staying. Uh, as he pulls up, you are uh, greeted by a sight 
Uh, the Nahani Lodge is a cozy log cabin style hotel nestled in the heart of Glacier Ridge. Um, it has a warm, rustic exterior with a spacious veranda and a, uh, as you guys get out. You see a warm glow of soft lighting and a towering stone fireplace through the doors in the lobby. As you guys walk in, you, you see the rich wooden furnishings and cozy rooms that are in the place. Um, the smell in the air kind of carries a comforting aroma of freshly baked bread and hearty meals. Well, you also have a hint of wood smoke from the fireplace, and it adds to that cozy ambiance of the place. It emanates a sense of serenity and tranquility, as well as the plush armchairs that are all around you are inviting you to sit and unwind. You kind of hear somebody in the corner playing on a grand piano which basically just has a calming backdrop to the conversations of other people that are kind of talking around it basically is just a feeling of refuge and camaraderie that is exuding from this place um standing behind the counter you see a woman in her late 30s uh, with warm auburn hair that falls in loose waves around her shoulders her eyes are a deep shade of green and she's wearing a welcoming smile she's wearing uh, practical comfortable clothing and um, she looks up at you as you walk towards her she's like oh uh one two three there's eight of you i was expecting you um tom right He's like, yep, that's me. Uh, you have our rooms already? Yes, I do. Um, I have five sets of keys here. Uh, sorry, six sets of keys. And he's like, all right. Um, so a couple of us are going to be bunking together in the crew here. Wyatt, I know you requested your own room, so you get your own room. Thank you. You're welcome. Just don't go wandering off like last time. Of course not. It was All irresponsible right. of me, and I won't do it again. Exactly. I have learned my lesson. Good. Uh, she hands each of you keys. and She's like, now, if you need anything, uh, my name's Evelyn, and I can help you with whatever you're looking for. Now, um... Please be aware that uh, the woods are a dangerous place, so if you're planning on going out, make sure you bring a buddy with you. Noted. Buddy system. Um, as you uh, head into the rooms, you, yeah, you see everything is very comfortable in here you each have your own like uh furnace that is like you can feel the heat of the fire coming out of it because that's what's heating the whole place basically it's this wood burning stove that has pumped throughout the place <clears throat> All right, so everyone, it's been a very long day. I understand if you all want to just relax and have a good night's sleep, maybe have a shower, bath, wash the airport, airplane, whatever, off yourself. <laughs> then we'll all regroup the next day. Sound like a plan? Sounds great. Perfect. So tomorrow, we'll meet, meet up at 10 a.m. Sound good? Perfect. Um, all right. So all of you head off to bed. I mean, that can be where we're going to call it for the night. Uh, can I make the first roll? What do you want to roll? 
I would like okay. to roll for premonitions. Um, do you want to do that now, or do you want to do it at the start of the next game? Up to you. I thought we could end on something kind of some foreshadowing. If it goes well, I mean, I might roll horrible, so. Uh, sure, you can roll. I just got to pull up your character sheet here again and figure out what premonition. Oh, hey, what do you know? Damn. That is a 12. So uh, I'll let you keep that roll. That's fine. But we haven't started the mystery yet, and that's when you're supposed to roll premonitions. Oh, uh, okay. I'll um, let you keep the 12, though, because that's a good roll. So I'll let you hold on to that but we haven't started the mystery so once we start the mystery then you can okay i wasn't okay. sure if this was the start of it or not no we didn't, we're going to be starting the mystery tomorrow okay okay so that is the start and intro of our glacier ridge campaign i hope everybody is excited to get into it and uh, learn more about it and uh yeah Hope everybody has a great night, and we'll see you all next week, and hopefully we actually have Victor and Maxine with us next week as well. Actually, we will not have Maxine, I can guarantee that. Okay. She's going to be here, so. Oh. So unless she's planning on joining me, which I doubt, but we'll see. That'd be cool. I don't have two sets of headphones. Maybe I'll tell her to bring her own. Um, there you go. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye.